Quickly to Carl's second talk, which will be the tools of liberty. The man we love to love, Carl Hess. make another plug. I just bought one of these wonderful posters and discovered to my delight that the uh, brown paper bag it comes in is almost as attractive. <laughs> so it's a double bargain. Uh, let me continue a bit from last night just to provide a little continuity. Uh, I talked about the, the necessity of, of being very positive about your own uh, life. And, I'd like to extend that to the politics uh, a bit of, of libertarianism. It's very easy to criticize, of course, and libertarians are extraordinarily good at that, particularly if they're criticizing other libertarians. But it is also, it seems to me, quite uh, apparent that libertarian, or liberty, provides such an attractive political agenda or social agenda that we should be very careful to always emphasize its positive nature. One, socialism has failed everywhere. There is no instance of a, of a socialist adventure having uh, increased the well-being over a long period of uh, a majority of people. It's a, it's a minority political operation that benefits a small elite wherever it has arisen and has not uh, uh, benefited others. The Soviet Union remains at an industrial level and not very far advanced from that of the czars. Uh, and one of the reasons, of course, is that it has maintained the uh, czarist uh, uh, organizational methods. So libertarians, however, can make certain extraordinarily uh, attractive and honest claims. For instance, people are concerned about prices. The free market is the only successful guarantor of lowering prices that has ever been devised. It always works uh, to lower prices, never to raise them except sporadically. Because, of course, the moment a price starts going up in one, uh, for one commodity, there is somebody who figures out how they can sell it for a few cents less. The way to sell in the free market, obviously, is either to produce a superior product, which is good and benefits everybody, or to cut prices. And Price cutting is, a, uh, is an attribute of the free market that is uh, notable. So prices, people who are concerned about prices should be concerned about liberty. They get lowered prices by it. There is the concern about consumer protection. Well, the free market is the only provider, again, of consumer protection that there isn't. And there should be strong clues to this. For instance, a subscription to consumer report is more important than all of the money spent on the, uh, the various uh, government uh, consumer uh, protection uh, agencies. But what is the, what's the hitch? It's an individual responsibility, and of course, to collectivists of any sort, that's intolerable. And yet it works. It works and the other doesn't. Collectivism does not work, the free market does. Environmental protection. Uh, people are understandably concerned by that, and it is quite clear now that the despoilation of the, of the environment in this country is a federal project, by and large. The major, the major producer of pollution in this, uh, in this country, uh, as Andre <laughs> likes to put it, the lower 48, <laughs> is the, our, our municipalities. Uh, the federal government itself, of course, is a, is a major polluter. The, those who are worried about uh, nuclear pollution should be worried about the uh, sponsor of it, which is not uh, any particular power company, but the people who sold them the fuel, the federal government. And uh, the, uh, the instances of, of the free market, all of the instances developed by the research of the people who are described as new resource uh, economists, uh, indicates very powerfully that people who own land take care of it much better than people who don't own land, and that the environment everywhere in the world uh, is improved by ownership and destroyed by the lack thereof. So that the Soviet Union, as a matter of fact, is more polluted than uh, the United States in the race between socialist pollution and uh, uh, state capitalist pollution. The socialists are, are even worse than the state capitalists. 
although state capitalists are nothing to brag about, as you, as you know. And so in, in every instance, we have something positive to talk about. Certainly, people are worried about security of their neighborhoods. It's quite clear that, <clears throat> that uh, public or government police forces cannot protect. Uh, they can occasionally do what the Philadelphia police force did <laughs> and save the neighborhood by destroying it, which is an activity they probably learned from the Department of Defense. Hmm. And so we, you can, we can guarantee that uh, in, in neighborhoods of high crime that the privatization of protection would work. The governmentalization of it has never worked. And so these are positive things that, that I think uh, we can emphasize, and it's, it's very good. Again, we should speak no evil of the free market or of, uh, of other libertarians because there's too much positive to talk about uh, in, in all of those cases. Now about tools, I am, uh, I don't know, since I arose from the primordial slime, I've discovered that the thing that intrigues me most about, about life, really, or, or my daily career in it, is the use of tools. I would feel, uh, uh, I would feel less than uh, pleased if I had no tools to manipulate. Uh, one of those tools is my mind, of course, but there are many other things that make life a good deal more pleasant. Uh, you see, I spoke of the chipmunks the other day, and I like to look at chipmunks, but I'd hate to be one. I enjoy being the most, uh, a member of the most violent landscape changing of all species, uh, the human race. And I'm convinced that uh, uh, it's pleasurable. Well now about tools, uh, not to bore you with, uh, with too many uh, scholarly things, but the only scholarly thing I've done lately is to make a list of uh, of tools that are important and uh, of their impact in the world, and so <laughs> I'll uh, I'll start out by making this case, which uh, some of you probably are bored to death uh, hearing about if you've heard it once before. But I think it's it's worth thinking about. See, we're we're under the uh, we're all taught, I believe, at an early age that. The things that change the world are ideas, and I agree with that, but I'm inclined to think that we miss some of the ideas. That, as a matter of fact, it is not the ideas of, of social theorists and po political theorists that have changed the world so much as the ideas of industrialists and of scientists and of tool users. And I've uh, looked around to see if there's any, any reason to bear this out, because occasionally it's nice to have some data to back up your prejudices, although not at all necessary. <laughs> and uh, I start with the fact that it is, it is said that uh, Christ uh, was the major turning point in the history of the world, and I, I, give, I give that turning point great credit for an extraordinarily powerful uh, set of philosophical and social statements. There's no question about that. But as for changing the way people live day by day, it hasn't uh, really done too much uh, of that. That is to say, the same wars seem to occur with the same frequency, theft and looting goes on at, at pretty much the same uh, rate of speed. So I don't see that it made a great change in the way people live day by day, but 300 years before uh, the birth of Christ, uh, there was the, uh, the time of Euclid. Uh, I, I peg the emergence of the human race, actually, <laughs> uh, at, at Euclid, because it seems to me that was the first time somebody had, had really got serious about the process of thinking. And so 300 years before that, Euclid laid out his, uh, his elements. The, I think one of the very first books I ever read in my entire life, and my mind still reverberates, well, this, 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 this revelation that a human being uh, out of virtually thin air and a thick mind had produced not only statements about the physical world, but was able to explain how he had thought about it. My God, this is the most astonishing 
intellectual adventure, I think, in, in the history. I think that's it. That's all of a sudden we were human beings. So there was Euclid. And what, what, what happened because of that? You know, you can take all of the theories that, that we treasure so much, and you can trace a lot of it back to this tool that Euclid provided. We could measure things at great distances. So property concepts became feasible. You didn't have to say, well, I own everything from uh, the Adriatic coast to the here. You, people had to start getting a little more precise about it, you know. My property line, which can be measured now, uh, is this, and so forth and so on. And, but particularly, I think it was the, the first statement of the most glorious intellectual achievement of the human race, and that is the scientific method the questioning, the aligning and arraying of proofs and demonstrations and so forth. This is the epic, it seems. This is, what, this is when human beings stopped being chipmunks and became human beings. Well, enough for the beginning. In 1000 AD, a date that will surely uh, lives in your memory, uh, Otto III uh, made Rome his permanent residence, and Venice consolidated its rule over the Adriatic Empire. Terribly important stuff if you, if you are sentenced to spend much time with, with historians. And uh, at the same time, however, some people say that Sridhara, who was an Indian mathematician, invented the concept of zero. Well, I offer to you the notion that zero has changed the way people lived uh, considerably more than the uh, Roman Empire and uh, the, uh, uh, the Venetian Empire. I mean, people began, they began to be, you were able to count limitlessly, among other things. Well, that's very important. You see, imperial activities had restricted the way people lived. The invention of, of zero sort of opened it up, made it possible for people to extend beyond their, their past limitations. There's the Magna Carta in 1216. I've heard all of my life that this dippy document is important. And I've read it and read it, and I can't see that it goes much beyond a, a minor agreement between one bunch of thugs with another bunch of thugs. <laughs> in which one bunch of thugs says, we want to have certain freedoms to practice our thuggery without uh, being uh, reined in by the big thugs. You know, a bunch of dukes and earls and other people like that. Of what possible consequence are such loopy people? Uh, they do nothing. I mean, the, whoever invented the English longbow uh, brought that whole system to a standstill. When it began to cost more to maintain an armed knight than it cost to kill an armed knight, uh, things changed. So I would say, you know, the Magna Carta, by God, you know, make shaft, make a fletchings out of it for your arrows. That's about what it's worth. Uh, so that was a tame time, however, that Arabic numerals uh, began to be used uh, in uh, uh, in Europe. Well, I mean, I think we all understand that there's certain clumsiness about the Roman number system. <laughs> it's hard to make change uh, with it. So this was, was terribly important. It was also, uh, just shortly before that, one of my favorite uh, mathematical trick, tricksters, Mr. Fibonacci, had been working. But in 1453, the Hundred Years' War ended. <laughs> and also the Gutenberg Bible. Well, you know, the Hundred Year War was just the uh, part of this endless series of wars that, that people have when they uh, spend too much time not reading uh, about things. The Gutenberg Bible in movable type was a big deal. I think it began to change the way people lived. Uh, certainly the war business uh, just kept on. Well, 1492, uh, a name which lives in Limerick history, uh, that was uh, Columbus, who, ne <laughs> who didn't know where he was going, and his people as people pointed out, did it, did it on federal funds. Uh, but this was also the same time that Copernicus uh, entered uh, Krakow University. Well, I think that's a pretty big deal. Copernicus began to really shake things up, didn't he? It was also uh, Martin Luther got his divinity degree there. Now, here's an interesting thing. 
of the Reformation, what effects of the Reformation really seem to make some difference? I don't think the theological thing made much difference. I mean, whether you had a bunch of little popes or one big pope or that sort of thing. But what did make a tremendous difference was Luther's insistence on native languages. So that instead of reading in Latin, people began to read in their familiar languages. And so that what values could be derived from scripture and, and other things began to be an ordinary informational possession instead of being the informational monopoly of, of a few people. So that was important. In 1589, um, as the Bourbon Kings, they make good whiskey, but uh, <laughs> began. And uh, I don't know if, if anybody really remembers that or if it changes much, but that was the same time exactly that the first knitting machine was made. And while Henry was doing what the governments do well, he was laying siege to Paris, uh, coal mining began in the, uh, in the Ruhr Valley. Well, coal mining is a much more important enterprise in changing the way people have lived than laying siege to Paris. <laughs> doesn't change much, doesn't make much, and so forth. Well, it goes on. I give Pocahontas and John Rolfe got wed, which struck a mighty blow for uh, uh, interracial marriages. Uh, but Napier also uh, did his thing on logarithms. At, at just the same year, isn't it incredible? that how far back these impressive things happened, but what we remember are sort of the ricky-ticky events <laughs> of, of history. Well, uh, Cardinal Richelieu was riding high at exactly the time that William Harvey uh, at St. Bartholomew's announced the, uh, his discovery of the circulation of blood. Well, Cardinal Richelieu was a prime politician, no question about that, but. I find it more comforting to know that my blood circulates. <laughs> and, uh, oh, there's a funny thing. In, in 1635, there was the Peace of Prague. <laughs> I don't know which piece it was, but, <laughs> but anyway, there was a piece of, and Connecticut was colonized. And uh, this, uh, this is a terrible year when you get right down to it. Because this was the year, I gathered, that the first speed limit was set. They set a speed limit of three miles per hour on coaches in London, uh, thereby beginning an entire series of mischievous uh, interferences with transportation. Well, the Cossacks crossed the Urals in 1636. Now, the Cossacks were fancy dressers, and I do believe they may have contributed to fashion considerably, but as to the civilization of the, uh, the planet, very little. But that was the same time that William Gascoigne invented the uh, micrometer. And the micrometer, again, that changes the way people live. I mean, it doesn't do much good to go into a, your local metal worker, although John Moses Browning was said to do it, to go in and say, I'd like something about that thick with a bump on it that high. I, it's much easier to tell them that you want something that's six ten thousandths. And uh, so it goes. So Gascoigne, hooray, uh, Cossacks, boo. Uh, <laughs> well, the 1660s, there were 50 or so major treaties and wars, the usual thing. You see, nobody's changed the way they, they live in politics, but they're changing the way they live in ordinary life. Well, in this year, the treaties and the wars were still going on. And lo and behold, Sir Isaac Newton invents the differential calculus. <laughs> Well, what would you choose to have in the world? 50 wars and treaties or the differential calculus? You see, and you could almost say you, you have this option. You can either be interested in wars <laughs> and such things, or you can be interested in the differential calculus. If you really want things that change the way people live and make life more pleasant, you opt for calculus. If you have a miserable view that people should be inflicted upon constantly and made to suffer endlessly, or for any reason whatsoever, then of course you opt for treaties and wars. Uh, Peter the Great uh, was doing uh, all of his stuff. Now Peter the Great, there was a sad sack right down to it. He had perfectly good instincts. He was a craftsperson, he was a builder, he worked in a boatyard for a while, and he wanted to industrialize Russia. So what did, did he adopt any sensible ways of doing it? like saying there's a buck to be made or anything like that? No, he said, do it or I'll kill you. <laughs> you know, which didn't exactly inspire uh, a great burst of creative activity. <laughs> and so uh, 
he industrialized it at the point of a gun, which is to say he didn't really industrialize it. He should have known a lot better. But alas, he was a czar. He was not a boat builder. If he'd been a boat builder, he would have done a much better job. But at any rate, that was the same time that Lady Mary Wortley Montague, her name should be blessed, and should remind us, as a matter of fact, that women have been doing extraordinarily good things in the sciences and the arts throughout history, but the fact that they don't wage war very well has sort of plunged them into the, uh, the back pages. There's a dumb one. Well, at any way, uh, Lady Mary introduced inoculation against smallpox to London. Now, if she'd withheld it from the politicians, <laughs> well, you got the, the French and English War in North America was underway when the first woman uh, uh, medical doctor was graduated from the University of Halle in Germany. Well, again, you know, this is a, a big thing. That was a much more important event, I think. That, oh, gosh, it goes on. There's so many wonderful things. I'll, I'll skip ahead. Oh, a great one. 1823, there was the Monroe Doctrine. Great advance in civilization. Extending the perfectly ridiculous notion that we owned, <laughs> we owned everything from, from California to Tierra del Fuego. <laughs> Without anybody else agreeing to it, but nonetheless, there was this outrageous uh, doctrine which has been getting us in trouble ever since, but it wasn't a bad year because that was the very year that Babbage began to work on his calculating machine, uh, which was the forerunner of the computer, which did change and has changed the way people live. And again, a reminder, Babbage said that when he was working on the machine that the only person in Europe who understood what he was doing was Ada Augusta Byron, uh, who was the first computer programmer on the face of the earth. She was Byron's daughter. And tragically, she's been remembered, not by programs uh, that do a lot of good, but the Defense Department has just named uh, their, their major new effort, Ada, in her honor. They could have spared her that ignominy, I think. <laughs> well, at any rate, there was that. Well, it goes on and on. There's a, you know, you get, you get things like Tyler, whoever he was, a president of some sort, succeeded another president named Harrison. Now, did Tyler change your life, or Harrison? I mean, who are these, these droll people? But at the same time, there was a fellow who certainly changed my life, and that was Whitworth. He proposed standard screw threads. Unfortunately, we have maintained his original screw thread, and anybody who has had to deal with Whitworth screws, which is the son of a bitch, quit while he was ahead. But at any rate, that's a big deal. That changes the way people live. Well. Mexican-American War, <clears throat> glory, 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 hallelujah. Uh, I assume Reagan's great-grandfather was responsible for it. And this, <laughs> the same year, John Deere introduced the steel mold board plow. Mm. Now we get into some heavy-duty activities. Because in 1847, Marx is, is going big. He's attacking Proudhon, one of his great mistakes. In the same year, uh, Boole uh, presented the basis of his algebra. Now, Marx, let me, the only person I know of, or persons I know of, who feel that Marxism has changed the world are conservative Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> who ascribe to Marxism an almost supernatural power. Well, their supernatural power can be measured in caliber. Uh, their, they, their supernatural power is nothing but ancient thuggery, again. If you don't do it, they shoot you. That's uh, not a very subtle thing. And it's not really commanding and winning the hearts and minds of people. It's shooting them if they don't act this way. I mean, if Marxism were successful, there would be a lot of immigration to Marx land, wouldn't they? There's no uh, immigration to Marx land ever. So we know Marx didn't change the way people live. He simply extended the rule of the czar into modern political rhetoric. But Boole did, present, did uh, begin to set the stage, not only for the way we live day by day, everyone in this room is affected by Boolean algebra, but he set in motion very probably the process that will bring down the entire Soviet empire and all tyrannies, 
all tyrannies have marched through history on their monopolization of information. Where information flows freely, people are free. The Soviet Union now faces the exquisite choice of either permitting information to flow in the system and introducing personal computers into the economy or remaining at an industrial level much more reminiscent of the turn of the last century than the beginning of the next one. And now what choice will they make? I believe that there are more and more practical people in the Soviet Union and their choice will have to be toward the very thing that will end uh, their bureaucratic hegemony. They will have to opt for information or starve to death because I do not believe that the United States government can subsidize them forever. <laughs> if it were not for the United States government on the one hand, backing uh, small revolutionary movements into a pro-Soviet corner on the one hand, and if it were not for the American government's constant subsidization of the failures of socialism through the price-supported uh, export of grains and so forth, the Soviet Union, I'm convinced, would have begun crumbling years ago, probably right after the Second War. Well, ha ha, yeah, 1865, uh, Lincoln was assassinated. I, I regard Lincoln as one of the, the major unfortunate uh, events in our history because, as he pointed out, uh, his interest was not in freeing slaves, it was in preserving the Union. And uh, my motto has long been, balkanize everything. And so I feel that uh, a, a, a South set free would have enjoyed what it richly deserved. A, a, a rebellion by black people who would have been joined very probably, very probably by uh, uh, white people, most of whom did not own slaves, that there could have been a different sort of South, that at least it would have been a South free and independent instead of one that became a major ward of the, uh, of the federal government and later the Democratic Party. So I think that the assassination of Lincoln uh, by another disgruntled uh, theoretician of, of social uh, matters uh, was tragic, as the death of any human being is. However, that was exactly the year that MIT was founded. So in the great scale of things, I would say Lincoln changed little, MIT's changed the universe. The, uh, the Labor Party was formed in England in 1893 and Ford built his first automobile. No social theory ever propounded on the face of the earth has as profoundly changed the way people live as has the application of the internal combustion engine to wheels. This has more distinctly changed the patterns of life, the patterns of settlement, and the ordinary activities of human being than all of the political activities of, of, the, of, of, of our era. And that was, uh, so Henry Ford, well, think of what Henry Ford, Henry Ford was obnoxious in some ways, but think of the incredible thing that he did also. While all of classical economists were saying at the time that you could not raise wages and lower prices, Henry Ford raised wages to historically high levels and lowered prices. He completely, an industrialist, not a theorist, an industrialist wrecked and threw out classical economics. And not by argument, but by demonstration. So there, it, an argument could be made that this toolmaker, this mechanic, was a more important economist than any other person who has lived in our time. Well, McKinley was re-elected and Planck uh, did quantum theory. Lenin and Trotsky formed the Bolshevik faction of the Russian Social Democratic Party in 1903. Big deal, no change. And what else happened? The Wright brothers. Which reminds me of something. My stepfather saw them fly. Actually, he saw the Wright brothers fly. He later saw me fly an F-80. He saw the Wright brothers fly at about 30 knots. He saw me fly at 700. And if he had stuck around a little longer, he would observe people flying at 23,000 miles per hour. Not a bad increase in velocity for very few years. 
Well, there was the, uh, oh, 1932, another big year. Franklin Delano Ugg. <laughs> and some of his soulmates uh, did roughly the same thing. He won the election here, and guess who won the election in Germany? The Nazis won by 230 seats. Uh, they got a plurality in the Reichstag proving the inevitable wisdom of the democratic process. Uh, and of how secure everyone is if they will simply permit the, everybody to vote. Well, so they got in. Well, those events uh, we all regard as disasters, both of them. I don't want to see any, any backsliding on this one. <laughs> There will be a short exam. You know. <laughs> but 1932, that was the same year. Who got the Nobel Prize in 32? Heisenberg. Hooray, Heisenberg. Boo, Hitler. And boo, boo, FDR. <laughs> well, then there was the, uh, the Marshall Plan was 47. And the common form was uh, created, which was the great uh, Communist Party propaganda machine that corrupted everybody so much that they, again, had to be made to go there by the point of a gun. That was the same year that the transistor was developed. Now I ask you, what changed the world? The transistor, like the automobile, that's changed everybody's life. It's changing people's lives in, in, in the jungles of Zaire and in penthouses in Manhattan. That changed. Who did that? Did it come? Three guys working at Bell Labs. What was so odd about Bell Labs that it wasn't operated like any other part of the Bell system? It was a place where individuals did virtually independent research. So what does this tell us about important things? It tells me that nothing good ever comes of collective activity. Nothing. Everything that we regard as good and useful in the world comes out of the inspiration of an individual human being, working with others probably, but not working with them in the sense where they're submerged, where they are unimportant, individuals create useful things. Collectivities produce wars. Is the, ma the major invention of collectivism, of nationalism, which is collectivism, is war. Well, in 62, the uh, first US mission was established in Vietnam, in which case we decided the Russians had had enough uh, a go at imperialism, we should try it ourselves since it's so good for the Russians. <laughs> Which is a, a strange theory that people like William Francis Buckley Jr. Uh, maintain, and that is that if the Russians do it uh, and it works well, we should do it immediately because that means that we're defending ourselves against communism by becoming like communists. <laughs> well, hmm. At any rate, 62 was also the year that uh, Crick, and can anybody remember the other two guys? <laughs> Wilkins and Watson uh, got their Nobel for uh, the molecular structure of DNA. Well, this is my particular pet, <laughs> that's a matter of fact. I think genetic engineering has, among other things, it's come at exactly the right time because we really need to restore a lot of very badly damaged the seed varieties, particularly. It's come at exactly the right time to, to get on with the process, the, the process of living forever, which strikes me as being a useful one. Dying is a an, 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 an terribly inconvenient interruption <laughs> of, of anybody's important work. And certainly genetic engineering gives us a hint of immortality. Uh, and people have always striven for it. It certainly explains the, the most cherished appeal of Christianity is the notion of immortality. And it strikes me as it would be mean-spirited for geneticists to not understand why Christians crave it, and it would be ungenerous for Christians not to understand and appreciate that others may achieve it uh, in, in temporal terms. Well, in 69, Nixon was inaugurated and Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. Well, now this brings us to the matter of tools in general and how they will impact on liberty. And the moon's a good place to start. It seems to me absolutely incredible that uh, politicians generally, social theoreticians generally, people generally, do not take into account 
that we are poised on the edge of our planet about to step out into space. It's, it's such an obviously epical a time for us. Uh, can't be stopped. Now that NASA's getting out of the business, it should proceed, proceed very swiftly and very successfully. Merchant adventurers always have carried culture and peace in the world. And government employees have always carried war and suffering. And so when the merchant adventurers go into space, as they surely will in the lifetimes, I, I hope, of as many of the people are here today, uh, things will change. They cannot fail but change. Because the merchant adventurers will no longer be constrained uh, by any enormous uh, political power on the face of the earth. They will be out there. And they will be like aliens trading back to savage people still insisting on, on primitive industrial forms. If I hope, if I have a grandson, that he is one of the first miners in the asteroid belt. I just can't believe that there's a, a greater adventure awaiting us. And how wonderful this is, uh, how, how appealing this is for the cause of liberty to know that we're about to step out into space. Because how else can we do it gracefully and, and, uh, and, and uh, skillfully if we do not do it as free individuals? I mean, can you imagine a bunch of galley slaves uh, operating uh, uh, out into space? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, no, space is for free people, and so we're about to go there. And then, as I say, genetic engineering, it can't be uh, uh, kept uh, in the shop forever. It will come out. And so these, uh, many of the enormous problems, such as the problems of, of agriculture, begin to change when people are able to begin to design uh, agricultural produ production precisely for the pieces of ground uh, that they're involved with, how much better it will be than this, this silly system that we've had recently of uh, ex so-called extensive agriculture in which people have just sown things willy-nilly without caring uh, anything much about the ground it was sown in. Uh, I think that will be very important. There are other technologies. Of course, we all know the impact that computers have had on the cause of liberty and how what a positive impact this can be. Just as a, a point of information, how many people in this room are either professional or part-time computer programmers? <laughs> well, that's rather interesting. It's, uh, there's no question about it. It is the largest single occupational grouping in the Libertarian Party. This means that the Libertarian Party has within it more people devoted to the free flow of information than anything else. I mean, it is the heart and the soul of computer programming. Uh, first of all, that it be logical. And secondly, that it... Uh, that it reach out, that it spread information. Well, how in the world can bureaucrats contain this? How can they? They can't. What is happening in the entire industrial world is, is a fracturing into smaller, more skillful, and more flexible manufacturing units. And this can't be contained, but bureaucrats don't understand this. You see, to Ronald Reagan uh, and to many uh, conservative Republicans, who are our most natural allies, actually, on most questions. Uh, to many of them, they do regard the computer as something apart from human life, just as liberals regard nature as something apart from human life. They, they think of rabbits as somehow having rights, but people not. And, uh, and the same thing with these, these conservative Republicans. They, uh, you, you, you hear of conservative Republican managers who say things like, let's ask the computer. Well, you know then you're dealing with a first-class idiot uh, and a person who's on his way out of history because what he really means is, let's, let's ask the programmer. Now, we're among friends in here, so let's confess it. There is no more lunatic gang of people on the face of the earth than computer programmers. They're, they're playful. They are anti-authoritarian to their teeth. 
the whole the whole science developed out of the most extreme anti-authoritarianism. They are, in short, not to be trusted. <laughs> They're certainly not to be trusted by authoritarians. <laughs> I ran across a young programmer one time who was doing a program for the Chicago Police Department uh, so that they could keep track of medication, I presume, so they could poison people on purpose rather than at random. <laughs> and I said, well, do you think that this uh, program might do terrible mischief or make their job easier? He said, no, he said, I've left enough openings in it. I can get back any time I want. And I believe that... Uh, you know, all, everybody now has friends using NATO satellites for their own nefarious purposes. <laughs> and uh, as a friend of mine put it for the... It is true that they, meaning people who seek power, can listen in on everything we do, but then we can listen in on them now. So it's, it's beginning to tilt. It's beginning to tilt. There's obviously a brain drain out of the... Uh, out of the power-seeking areas because there's no profit to be made in working for the government, really, when you get right down to it. And there's very little profit to be made for working for IBM, for most people. So what happens? People are beginning to go into business for themselves in greater numbers than ever before. And I just say to you that a person who owns and a person who works for themselves is a fairly dependable ally of liberty. No matter what else they say, uh, these people are our most natural allies. And uh, there are more of them every day, and they do better and better work. The, uh, the change that tools make can be seen uh, also, uh, I think the agricultural thing is, is, is really very a big one, by the way. That one of the nicest things that happen, is happening today is the bankruptcy of so many farmers who are very poor farmers. Now, bankruptcy has always been a good way to clean systems out. And I think that a farmer who was in the business of uh, spending $80,000 for a combine to, uh, to harvest dollar wheat needs very badly to be weeded out uh, of the system, and it's happening. And I've sworn I will never again go to a movie in which somebody pitifully comes to center screen and says, we can't make a living on this farm, we don't farm well, uh, or anything, however we've been doing it for a hundred years, therefore we should be permitted to do it forever. Thank God the buggy whip manufacturers didn't have movies. Uh, or we'd all be lashing our Avantes. <laughs> so at any rate, I think that'll work out very well. And who are the farmers who are not being affected? The farmers who were good farmers all along. The farmers who were who were depending not on chemicals, but on the soil. They were depending on small scale, very highly intensive uh, uh, production of, of uh, food. As you all know, uh, I'm sure you should know, the uh, yield per acre of American agriculture is, is low, internationally low. Our yield for, per man hour is the highest in the, in the universe. Uh, but uh, your stomach doesn't know much about yield per man hour. It knows an awful lot about yield per acre. And there are, very, there are many countries in the world that produce, on average, much more uh, per acre than we do. And again, uh, an interesting sidelight on that is the most productive uh, uh, crop producing area in the world, I believe, is in Abu Dhabi in about six acres of greenhouses, hydroponic greenhouses, where the rate of production is considerably, by orders of magnitude, greater than any. Uh, soil-based uh, agriculture. It just shows that the technologies are changing, and these are technologies that have a wonderful impact on liberty because they mean that people can do things more as they wish, more with their neighbors and in local situations and in more individualized ways. Custom, custom work uh, rather than mass work. The ultimate technology, uh, I believe, will be nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a concept that some folks at, at MIT uh, have been working on in a book of, of uh, one of the group, uh, a fellow named Drexler, has written a book on it called The Engines of Creation. Nanotechnology proceeds from the assumption that once you can program uh, DNA and once you can progr program a, a, a microorganisms, biological microorganisms, that you should be able to transfer the same techniques to inorganic materials. 
And uh, it also t uh, proceeds from the assumption that many microorganisms are very small machine tools. So that if you look at some viruses, you see exactly a, a drill press, a small drill press. It has, it has material handling uh, appendages that affix it to something, and then it has a drill. And it drills a hole, and it deposits things in the hole. Well, if, you can, if a virus can be a drill press, why can't you make a drill press that small? And as a matter of fact, if you can program uh, uh, proteins and so forth, why can't you program other things? These are the questions that are asked. And why can't we start manufacturing at the molecular level? Well, why not? You know, when you get right down to it, we're already dealing with sub-molecular uh, uh, materials already. The tip of the gadget on a tunneling uh, electron microscope that does the work is three atoms wide. Three atoms. Already dealing with, with things at an atomic level. So when people talk about doing manufacturing at a molecular level, they're not just uh, crazy uh, people. And it will happen. Once an idea is promulgated, it happens. And it happens with a greater speed uh, these days than ever before. And so all of the social systems based upon the allocation of resources uh, through political means will be obviously useless. And as a matter of fact, the market itself will become a much more rambunctious and tumultuous thing when people are having no shortages of materials and no shortage of uh, ability to manipulate them can design anything that anybody wants. And so we enter into probably uh, in, in our race's history into a design phase when the major project of people's lives will be designing completely the appurtenances and the directions and the activities of their lives where being a poet will be very important because you may want to uh, grow your house in a poetic fashion and so forth. Well, you know, it may not happen tomorrow but it will happen in some fairly soon tomorrow. And, and that, too, uh, it strikes me, just screams liberty. I mean, who else but free people can enjoy it, deploy it, maintain it? Uh, who, as a matter of fact, could have conceived of it? So the tools, the material tools, are all moving in our direction. Now for the ultimate tool. And a brief comment about that. The ultimate tool is the human mind. It's the ultimate artifact of the universe, so far as I can see. Now, the human mind does not spring forth uh, the day uh, an adult reads a novel, for instance. The human mind is present in some very small humans, uh, some of whom can barely talk. They're called children. And this is where our problems generally, it seems to me, begin and where they will have to be solved. To the extent that children are taught to be thoughtless, to be taught to be dependent, and denied the encouragement to think independently and critically, we will remain in a world uh, uh, filled with the problems that we abhor, the problems of dependency, of, uh, of uh, supplication, uh, of all of these uh, things, kowtowing to authority. Well, now, how can it possibly change? Well, libertarians have as their stated agenda spreading liberty. It occurs to me that uh, every libertarian ought to have as part of that agenda saving a child because uh, that's an important contribution to liberty. And what does this mean? It means at the outset a great and fervent resistance to government schooling. Government schooling is very probably the prime support of the, uh, the system of uh, of force and violence and coercion uh, that we abhor. It is where children are taught that the initiation of force and a good purpose is good. It is where they are denied thinking about it. When, when they're denied the, the joy of trying to understand why murder, which is evil for one person, is good for 40,000 or for 100,000. Now, it, it really... It may be almost as simple as that. If children are encouraged to think, they will not think these, these incredibly illogical, irrational uh, thoughts as they grow up. Well, how can libertarians encourage this sort of thing? 
Well, I have prejudices along these lines. Uh, first of all, if you have children, uh, teach them yourselves that it is a primary responsibility of libertarians not, for God's sake, of all things, to give their children to the state. to do this this thing well again I have I just I have biased observations on this I've used with children uh, in, in the area where I live uh, materials uh, prepared by the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children in Montclair New Jersey at Montclair State I'm sorry to say college <laughs> but you see I'm, I'm, I'm an improper libertarian I, I, I use their materials because their materials are the best I have ever seen for encouraging children toward independent and critical thinking. I would also recommend uh, consideration of what Seymour Papert has written in his extraordinary book, Mind Storms. Papert is the fellow at MIT who developed Logo, which is a language for kids. And he has said that the most revolutionary learning environment in the history of the world is one child and one computer left alone and encouraged to program it. And that is, of course, what Logo was designed to do. And he, he further, he makes the specific point that this returns education to the place where it ought always belong to the individual. It takes it out of the collectivity of society and returns it to the individual so that the individual becomes primarily responsible for the development of their own intellect. And they become responsible for it against all of the pressures to warp it to the service of others, uh, to warp it to, uh, to the uh, supine acceptance of authority. They begin to be encouraged uh, by this sort of uh, thing to, to be truly human beings and not just to be extensions of somebody else's machine. So I think this is, this is terribly important. Uh, interestingly enough, even in 600 government schools today, materials from the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children are being used. And I find it refreshing that the uh, government school system is driving a, uh, a stake into its own vampire heart uh, in this way. And I encourage it. I don't care. I mean, you be purist if you care to. But if I find a young teacher in a government school who is encouraging children to think rather than trying to teach them facts, <laughs> facts, uh, then uh, I would encourage that, that teacher. I would do everything to help them, even though it's in a government school. Uh, I learned in, in the 30s, when I was about to become a professional uh, military person, that, uh, very briefly, I learned that ideology uh, can sometimes uh, be counterproductive, because I recall there was the time in Nazi Germany when uh, uh, a hero of, of the Nazi regime uh, became a hero by bleeding to death on a street after a street brawl, refusing the services of a Jewish doctor. Now I tell you that that's the kind of, of ideology that kills, I believe, even your mind. When you get to the point where you're so wrapped up in an ideology that you cannot uh, take practical steps in your, uh, your own self-interest. I think you've gone a bit too far. And so if you find some young teacher in a government school who is attempting to do the one thing that will undo the state itself, I would say encourage that teacher. Uh, and, not, and do not abuse that teacher simply because the teacher is in an evil system. If you were in a concentration camp and found one guard to whom you could talk, I think you would be a perfectly uh, silly person to not talk to them and to enlist their aid in your escape. Uh, and, uh, but then, as I've told you, I'm not uh, ideologically pure or, or even versed. I just sort of ramble through life. And, uh, well, at any rate, uh, those are some comments on tools. I think it's all up for us. Everything's good. And uh, you, any discussion? Yeah. I think it needs to be pointed out that relative to, to government schools that by and large the funding for government schools comes on the basis of attendance. In other words, if we withhold our children, they don't get paid. 
I, th I think that's excellent. Of course, it's why it's so difficult to withhold your children. There, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not impossible. There are at least two states in the in the uh, in the the lower 48 and the other two uh, who have no laws against homeschooling now. I believe Missouri is one. I don't know. I forget which the other one is. So libertarians could sensibly work uh, toward that. That's a major political goal: is to remove all barriers to homeschooling or to any form of alternative schooling, as a matter of fact. Yes? I don't think that we should call teachers the work of the government teachers. I think we should call the government workers. I think that's, that's perfectly fine. Except I would think that uh, if you could be less than abusive when you find one who understands as you do. I was one of those. Yeah, well, there you are. You know, that's ex exactly, there are many libertarians. Uh, you don't want teachers, though. Uh, of course not. I know, and it happens, and that's why they need support. I know they and they need support, if not to support them in the government school system, they need support so when they leave it, as they inevitably will, there'll be some place to go and some other school to organize. And so I've, uh, I've, uh, there are two things, I think, along those lines that are important. I would encourage teachers to start their own schools, and I would encourage nurses to start their own clinics. I think these are two very important ways to start breaking monopolies. Yeah. I would just want what what will the collectivist structures, government and whatnot, be doing with all the new technologies and nanotechnology mm -hmm. and engineering while while uh, while uh, libertarians and free people uh, are, are using them as you suggest? Well, they will do uh, what they do with it now. They'll they'll devote it to police power. And uh, I have no, no doubt that it'll make them a little more stronger, but see, the thing about police power is that it is generally deployed by people who uh, have a mean streak. I mean, they really, uh, they have sort of a tight attitude toward the world, and they, they're very defensive. It's an, an us versus them kind of thing, uh, most of them. And so they're not terribly skillful beyond that. They're not very creative. And so every time the state adopts a technology, they adopt a, a technology that is essentially obsolete, uh, and they can't maintain it. For instance, that's a very good point, because today the defense of the continent rests not on the, uh, uh, in the hands of, uh, of paid professional military people. There are 6,000 contract workers today, many from places like Minneapolis Honeywell, who man the advanced weapon systems. They are not manned by military personnel. In short, the, the major defense system of the country has already been privatized in a way. And the reason, of course, is that you can't expect somebody who's a career lieutenant colonel uh, to know much more except being a, a, a lieutenant colonel. There are some exceptions, of course, like Grace Hopper, uh, who are, everybody I know who knows Grace Hopper wishes she wasn't an admiral. But on the other hand, uh, what the hell? <laughs> she sort of rises above all of that. So I think that's what they'll do. They'll deploy technology as they always have in very crude ways, but everybody, uh, other people, libertarians, will be ahead of them. And the, uh, the activities of free people will be more, more interesting, uh, more attractive, and more productive. I think we face a, a, a generations, as a matter of fact, of a, of a, uh, a society that will become much more a two-tiered society. Uh, there will be the tier of dependency and of bureaucratization. This will include General Motors, the federal government, and places like that. Then there will be the tier of adventure, which will be uh, Wozniak and Perot and uh, everybody else uh, doing adventurous things. And uh, I think they'll coexist. Well, they'll have to. You know, because even suppose that Jerry Falwell uh, became uh, Bishop Primate of the United States, as he clearly would like to be, uh, it, it, it would be a hollow victory for him because uh, uh, his folks, like, like many other uh, ideologues, are always too busy with ideology to attend to the growing of turnips. And so practical people attending to the growing of turnips would still have a dominant position in the society. And I think that it will be, that there will be the howling and yowling of the, uh, of the politicians and, and so forth on the one side with a great constituency of urban poor 
I think the cities will will start to become more like Delhi, uh, uh, very terrible places after a while, but they'll be the natural, uh, the natural uh, constituency of politics, and then there will be sort of an ebullient uh, uh, other economy, a productive economy of cybernated machine shops, of genetic engineers, of, of high intensity uh, farmers, of space travelers, and so forth. And uh, that gradually the appeal of the, uh, of the merchant adventurers will be greater, and the dependency, of course, on the st of the state on these people is 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 absolute. It actually always has been, except that there there's usually been more power on their side, but there isn't any more. So, uh, I, I guess that's the way it could develop. But the the frank uh, answer to that, is, of course, is I don't know, you don't know, he doesn't know, they don't know, nobody knows, because uh, you know. If, if, Fifteen weeks ago, nobody really thought, uh, took superconductivity that seriously. And now, fifteen weeks later, we know that next week may change the whole thing. We may be all on superconducting magnetic skateboards. Uh, and this will change everything. So the, the business of predicting is, 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 uh, uh, is sort of silly these days. Because the people who change history are the people who change history, the inventors, the scientists, and the industrialists are changing it more rapidly than ever before. And the politicians are changing nothing. So it's, I think it's the era. It's the era of the industrialist. It's the era of the scientist and of the producer and of the poets and the, and the adventurers. And uh, uh, we all wish government would just go away, but. On the other hand, it's a good place to store inept people. <laughs> I have sort of a charitable streak. I don't want to see everybody starve to death. Uh, so it's, I guess that, look, my, my final, the tools are all there. They're perfectly suited to all of our purposes. And the thing now is whether we're going to use it or not. I mean, if we choose to, to stifle ourselves and confine ourselves to the use merely of rhetorical tools, we will get nowhere. On the other hand, if we didn't use the rhetorical tools, we might not get to use the material tools. There's got to be balance in this thing. You know, you guard yourself with uh, your shield arm and you apply your monkey wrench with the other one. It's got to be that way. And so to be human, you need to be complete. I mean, the human being was not... Uh, Heinlein said it, that's the credo. You know, in the, in the notebooks of uh, Lazarus Long, when he talks about what a human being is, a person who can do everything, and then the final line is specialization is for insects. Well, that's a good point. Don't need it anymore. We're all universal geniuses now. And, uh, and liberty is a universally attractive idea. So I guess we just get on with it, right? <laughs> Thank you.